Well, I just wanted to say that we're very lucky to have Berchan here, as Felix mentioned, um, and I wanted to thank Moy for um, making this happen um, and bringing us all together. Um, and I wanted to tell a mini story about how I first met Berchan. Um, um, it was in the Milan's uh, Salone del Mobile, um, and it was right after he won the Moy Frame Prize, actually. Um, he was carrying the, the briefcase of, I think it was fake money, but, um, <laughs> but it's a nice connection to tonight happening, so thank you, Moy, for making it, it happen. Um, and any time I get the opportunity to chat with you, Berchan, is always um, really, uh, I really appreciate it. Um, so experiments is the title of the talk today, um, conversation really. And so I kind of wanted to start by talking about your process, which is um, a lot of your projects begin with sort of curiosities or um, you know, material experiments um, in your studio before they are industrially produced. Um, so I was thinking, if you look at your website, you know, you can make these very clear connections between the first experimental seeds um, that then become industrially produced. So I kind of just wanted to return to this idea um, because you often use these more primitive sort of handcrafted techniques um, that you experiment with um, in, in your approach. And I was wondering if you could just sort of start off by talking a little bit about that approach that you have and if you've always had that or sort of how you came to uh, came to that way, that method of working. Um, there's, there's a lot of questions in one question. <laughs> um, as for um, the, wh which one do you want to an answer first? Because, uh, uh, yes, well I have the, I have the luxury um, that I um, um, can start with experiments, or my, my way of working is very often sort of to, to play around with materials a lot. Um, I do, um, if you look at my archive, um, it's not a, a roll of sketchbook, but it's a roll of boxes. And in every box is sort of models and, and samples and uh, maquettes um, of things I've been thinking of. And um, if you look at, all the things in the archive, maybe 5% um, actually made it to a product of which that one in five actually makes into a product that makes money for the studio. Um, but then when it does, it, it generates that much amount of money that we can run the studio on it. Um, so I, I feel very lucky, or I'm in, a, I'm in a luxurious position that I can start with just do whatever I feel like. And then uh, after uh, working for 15 years as a professional designer, I um, um, how do I say this? Th I'm, I'm comfortable enough that what, what, when I do something that I really like, I know that this 1% of, of everything will um, make money for the studio. Technology fail. Um, yeah, I was hoping that we could also get into a little bit about how um, you sort of improvise with materials as well. Um, and, and the ultimate, at least how I see your work, is it ultimately becomes um, when you industrially produce these things, you're really pushing the limits or the capabilities or the, the possibilities of the manufacturing methods. Um, and I was wondering if you could sort of speak about that, if that was a goal that you had um, intentionally with a lot of the works or if it ended that way um, and if you could sort of speak about um, like I know your jumper chair um, and, and the yeah. sprinkles fabric um, textile for example um, and another project uh, are all using the same jacquard loom so maybe talk about how you learned from working with those machines um, yeah <laughs> No, because there's already three. The, uh, the it's it's not made on the same machine. There are actually, three different machines, and it's not a jacquard. No, no, not even. This. Well, the textile museum has some of it. Um, but I also remember that I want to finish my <laughs> previous answer. So this is going to be a confusing uh, uh, evening. 
Um, and what I try to do in the experiments is try to find the best way to um, uh, use a material to make something. So even when I start a, an experiment, it's not that I know I'm going to make a chair or that I know I'm going to make a light, but you sort of explore things and then at a certain point you think, hey, this could be, this has the, this is strong and this is stiff and this is something you can build up to 45 centimeters, so this could be a stool or uh, hey, this is translucent and it doesn't have any seams and it uh, distributes lights very well, so it could be a light. Um, but then the other thing, um, and that's why you, to get back to the jumper chair, um, which is um, I once did, uh, I was asked to be part of a, a, a group of 10 designers doing research in upholstery because um, um, the comment was that there's a lot of investigation of young designers um, doing chairs, but they're hardly ever upholstered because it's mostly they want to see the structure of the chair or they want to see this or that. Um, uh, of being very technical. And then they asked, can you do a research in upholstery? And one of the things I made for that research was um, a chair covered in felt, uh, but completely covered in felt. So it was seamlessly covered, because um, felt is made by rubbing wool together with uh, hot water and soap. And you can actually do it uh, with your hands. So you can, um, and is that chair? Okay, it's it's the green chair when it's. Uh, oh no, it, it, it only the jump. Uh, okay, yeah. um, if you go on the website, you'll find the green chair, which is seamlessly made. But it also took forty hours of hand felting. Uh, so it's it's sort of this idea that I make because I want to get it out of my head and I want to show it to people that I that I like it. Um, but it's still not very uh, industrial pr producible. Um, but I think maybe five years later, I was in the textile museum and they were showing this machine um, called the knit and wear. And what it can actually do is knit sweaters uh, without seams. You just, you, sh you, you broke, it's a, it's a knit, knitting machine, actually very close to what Nike uh, knits the, uh, their shoes with. Um, and the knitting machine can also, uh, if, if you look at the factory where they have the knitting machine, sweaters fall out once every while. <laughs> Complete sweaters. It's not that you have like s different parts that you have to sew together, uh, but like everything is seamlessly made. Um, and then I thought, hey, maybe I can finally make that seamless chair. But the problem with um, uh, knitted upholstery <laughs> is that it very often has too much stretch, uh, and stretch in the material will cause extra wear and tear, so you will not get a right Martindale number, and Martindale is the number you get for textile to, to make it very, um, like the, the higher the number, the, the more t wear and tear resistant the textile is. Um, but then um, the trick we did to make the knitting less flexible was wash the knitted cover very hot so it shrank and became felt. Um, actually, what happens when you wash that expensive sweater, cashmere sweater, in the uh, washing machine at a too high temperature, and then you get a very tiny sweater. Um, and that's how we um, knitted a cover for a chair uh, uh, for a company called Establishing Sons. And so that this halfway point where we had the felted chair to the point where we have an industrial produced chair that um, could have been, it wasn't because the, 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 the number wasn't high enough, but could have been even a competitive pricing regarding upholstery. Because um, uh, it, normally if you upholster a chair, the, the cost of textile plus the cost of sewing plus is um, we could all just short make a shortcut and knit a complete cover all in one for that particular chair. I'm so glad you're bringing up textiles because that's something I wanted to um, bring up as well. I think it's a great example of how you're pushing limitations of form um, through this constant experimentation and exploration that you do. Um, and in many ways, 
through textiles um, and rope, which is, I, I think, probably your signature material, um, you know, you're using a continuous piece of string to do the random lights, um, non-random lights, um, um, and with a jumper chair as well, um, or the other three-dimensional patterns that you've done, um, three-dimensional fabrics that you've done. Um, you're sort of approaching fabric or textiles as an object itself and, and pushing the dimensionality there in a way. Um, you know, you also have the pocket light, which is um, one continuous woven piece of material that becomes this three-dimensional light. Um, and so you first became interested in textiles, right, when you were really young, making kites. I was hoping you could talk about that. <laughs> well, you gave it away. <laughs> no. But, um, um, yeah, my first, the, the way I learned to sew was b because when I was, uh, uh, I think, 12 years old, I got into this thing called power kiting, where you have these big kites that will drag you across over the beach, uh, um, and, and they can pull uh, small carts, and what they do now, it, it was way before kite surfing, um, but we, very big kites, and at the time you could uh, buy a very expensive kite, or um, buy the materials and make it yourself, which I um, uh, love doing. And uh, But in the beginning, I was pushing my mom to make th the kites, and at a certain point, she, she stopped. She said, okay, now, you, now it's time you learn sewing yourself. And that's how I learned to sew. But it's still um, th uh, th the way a kite is made, I think it's still so nice that you can make something that needs to be strong and functional, but in the end, when there's no wind, it's a, it's a floppy thing. Um, uh, and, and I know that a lot of designers, when they design, they do uh, sketching of, of shapes and, and 3D um, models of things. Um, but I'm, I'm still in love with this thing that is just textiles and a few sticks that can become a thing. So uh, that's, that's the first. Um, um, the time I, I, I met textiles. And um, then later when I went to Design Academy in Eindhoven, um, I had the idea that um, if I wanted to be a designer, I had to study sort of industrial, the industrial design course that they had there called Man and Nutrition. Um, but after three or four years, I um, found out that textiles was my passion and I went to the styling uh, textile department called Man and Identity. Um, and I'm still very happy I went there. <laughs> um, people are probably really familiar with your masks, which I think are, a few of them are on the slideshow in the back there. Um, but you've also used that same technique of working with rope and this three-dimensionality for other projects as well, um, including the gloves, which I was hoping you could speak a little bit more about how that came about um, and, how, and jumpsuits as well. Um, and maybe you have others. <laughs> well, um, the mask that you that you see was actually something I, I really did for myself. Um, um, actually, m the first ones I made, um, like uh, in the afternoon when I knew that I didn't have a very productive day, um, and. Uh, it felt so good to finish something that day, or I mean, if you do design, uh, it's such a slow process. If you do a chair, it can be a year or maybe a year and a half before like the first sketches to, to the final product. Um, and I, in that way, I'm very impatient, and I like to re see results very quickly. So I, they, they, that's how the mass started, to, to be... Um, um, the way they are made is uh, taking rope, and the first rope I had just left over from another project. And uh, I tried to, to make a carpet by, by sewing it um, in a circle endlessly. But uh, that became a very curved carpet. Um, and then my assistant said, oh, you should make a mask. And I made a mask. Um, and then I made, in the end, I think, uh, about 160 masks. Um, that are really there, uh, like I, I sit down, I start, and by the end of the afternoon they're finished. So whenever I had a bad day, and a bad day for me is a day with a lot of talking or a lot of uh, uh, other 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 problems. Um, well, 
no, no, this is, this is good. Wait, wait, we <laughs> but a, a lot of meetings, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, um, um, and then th th they gave me that pleasure. And actually it took me half a year before actually showing them in a, in a design context. Um, and I'm, I'm still surprised by, uh, until today, that I meet people that know me from the masks. Because I think, yeah, but I did such good lights for Moy and a good chair and this. And, <laughs> and, I, and actually there's um, uh, commissions coming in for very serious projects. Like I did uh, um, um, upholstery for a chair at Casina. Um, and their reason to call was uh, the masks, uh, which... I was even surprised, like, oh, yeah, but this is, and they said, no, we like the colors that you use, and I think it's special, and we want you to make textile. Uh, and, um, and that's, uh, for me, also sort of the, the proof that this luxury position that, okay, the best thing you can give is the thing you like doing most, or that's what you're probably also very good at. Um, that's sort of proof that the thing that I like doing is something that you actually can make money with or get new commissions in. Um, we've sort of talked about this idea I have um, that you're sort of this modern day bricolure, um, kind of just gathering up materials that are kind of around you, um, non-canonical, um, just off the shelf materials um, that are immediately available that you use for the basis for a lot of your projects. Um, I was thinking of the Persian rug that you found that's also in the slideshow with the, the duct tape sort of fused onto it, um, or the downstairs light for Moy. Um, that you, you know, you found this off the shelf um, aluminum ladder from a hardware store and then um, put the LED lights in it. Um, and I was wondering if it was the immediacy of the materials um, that drew you to it, the convenience of it, or if there was something, some other reason for using those materials. Well, um, I, I don't see. I mean, I, I, of course, I do see a difference between the, the funny ready-made things where a carpet with duct tape or a ladder with the carnival lights that becomes a chandelier. Um, but the, the thing I like most is sort of, um, or the thing that I think design is about or where I get the joy out of in design is um, design is... Um, like the added value to material. So you, you start with um, a material and it becomes a product and the thing you do with it is, is manufacturing but the, the, the way of thinking about it is, is design. Um, and in the end, the, the product has to be more valuable than the material you use, very logically. Um, and so the, the smarter you use it, the, the better you can sort of double or triple or quadruple the value of the material. And the, the, the more you added value you can add. And, and so I just like cheap materials for that material because they can be so much more valuable afterwards. And as, as I love the beauty in cheap materials. Um, and Cheap materials also include sort of ready-mades, like an old rug or uh, a standard ladder that you can upgrade to, to be a chandelier, or a rug that you buy for maybe $50 in the flea market, and you can upgrade it to something that you can still have around the house as some, something funny for, for a few years. Um, so, so I don't see that big difference between um, the the the, the red, rough and ready made, uh, as we call it on the on the website, or the uh, dead serious products uh, that are mass produced in a, in a factory. Um, yeah, this idea of the ready made is something you continue to explore. Um, are you still working on those packs of toilet paper that you're wrapping in? Am I allowed to talk, ask you about that here? <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk about that project? It's such an incredible <laughs> project. Um, <laughs> are you still experimenting with those? <laughs> um, well, that, that was the time that we Skyped that I had just started a project. Um, 
Um, I'll, I'll just tell the anecdote, That's, uh, which is a better way of explaining the project than trying to explain the concept of this, because there's not really a concept. Um, I did these uh, poofs for Nike, which were uh, inflatable inner tubes covered uh, with laces, uh, sort of cleverly woven into a seamless cover for, for uh, inner tube which became a poof or a bed or a small pillow. Um, we, they were sort of, a thing, they were for me comparable to what the green felt the chair was uh, to, the, to the jumper chair. Um, it's a very nice idea, it's a good thing, but it has flaws and it needs work to be a good product. I mean, it's perfect to show at an exhibition to explain what Nike could be about or should be about but um, it needs work to be a product to, to actually hand over to people who can use it safely. Um, and so one of the, but now we get a lot of requests, well, can we order the poos for uh, this office or can we order them for this shop? Um, and so I started thinking of um, um, what is nice about the Nike project, um, but does not have all the flaws and maybe it's a step down so we can actually offer people something and um, then I started woving, weaving um, um, uh, polypropylene cord, which is the same cord I use for the masks, by hand um, around big soft objects. Uh, and one of the objects I, I found was very good was a roll of toilet paper to make a small sample. And, um, and then I found out that, oh, it's that's such a nice way to make these samples, because I think when I was speak speaking to you, I just had done a four pack of toilet paper. <laughs> and then I found the six pack and a 24 pack. So it became this modular system of, and these uh, rolls of toilet paper, they, in a way they fit because they're, in a, they, when you weave, um, you go from a straight fiber to a, to a, a zigzag fiber. So you actually, um, your weave becomes more compact which means that the thing you're weaving around has to be able to shrink a little bit, which the toilet roll of toilet paper does perfectly. Um, and then um, there was so much effort going into making that skin that I love the idea to have something very cheap in there. Because if I would have to try to find a piece of foam with the same qualities, um, it would be probably more expensive than the, than the cover. It would take more time than the cover. So I, I thought, no, that this roll of toilet paper is, is perfect to, to, to get that ready made. But actually after the, 20, the 12 pack, I, I quit making it and I started making more gloves. <laughs> it's still the rope. <laughs> um, we're doing a good time, but um, in curating as in design, um, there's this need for flexible strategies often. Um, and I was wondering, um, because each show is unique, or each design project is unique, um, has its own unique set of constraints. Um, and I was wondering how you approach your exhibitions. You've done um, a few exhibitions yourself. Some images are in the, in the slideshow, Tricks and Flicks, which you did in Design Parade um, in here in France. Um, and, and others, and I think you have one coming up as well um, with the artist, oh, yeah. Anneli Kroon, right? So. Yeah, <laughs> my Dutch is um, Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, the, the thing about, well, the thing I like most is um, making stuff, or uh, you can call it design, or you can call it uh, something else. But, um, and actually, I'm not a big fan of doing exhibitions because it, they always mean looking back and I just like looking forward so much better. You know, I, like, I like to think of new things and if you, and because uh, there's also people, I think, that, that keep asking for a book. Do you want to do a book? Uh, but then I think, oh, I have to go through all the archive and to think of all these other projects. And I know that they will all trigger new ideas, but, I'm happy with a few ideas I have now because they already take up so much time to actually get into something uh, being made. But once in a while we make an exception uh, to an exhibition. And the idea of um, the Tricks and Flicks one that you saw in here in, in the south of France was just before I was taking some sort of a sabbatical 
where I didn't stop working, but I stopped saying uh, yes to commissions. So I, I only did self-initiated projects that year. Um, and that was, um, the idea was to, to just look at everything uh, from the 14 years before. Um, so I always have to have a, like a, a very clear reason to do an exhibition. And the, the upcoming one with Anuli Krohn is, uh, um, is nice because she's, she's a friend, she's a painter, she's an artist, and when we talk about art and design, we really click. Um, but it will be in an art gallery, and I think it will be, the stuff that I'll be showing will be a lot of textile based, but um, you could call it art, although I, I'm still hesitating if you should call it art, but, but it's, for me, it's, that's the experiment of doing that exhibition, like, okay, what if we do something in an art environment and can it survive um, in that art environment? Because that's something that I'm very interested in now. Well, that made me think of a few questions, but um, you're also looking outside the fields of art and design. I know you've sort of cited Katarina Gross and Tom Sachs in terms of artists who are resonating with your way of working, um, but you're also, recently we're looking into a lot of neuroscience, um, which is a particular interest of mine. Um, and I was curious if um, you were reading this book, I think called We Are Our Brains. Um, I found it. <laughs> um, and I was wondering if you made any connections between um, that and design, between those fields. Yes. <laughs> no, because we also we talked about it, of course. Um, th there is, um, w when I read a book like uh, uh, We Are Our Brain or uh, when it is about uh, neuroscience, um, the thing that I'm most interested in is, is the thing like how c does creativity work um, and um, I myself I'm not uh, the most uh, organized person or I'm, it, it, I know my thinking is maybe you hear it in my way of talking that it's a bit chaotic or it's all over the place or from there and there and, and um, and that's to try to understand that and try to live with that brain. Or I know I know it's also the sort of the the reason why I became a designer or why I like making things and why I'm creative. Um, well, maybe this this <laughs> these words are a perfect illustration of me not being able to put together a, a, a good story about creativity or or how the brain works. But yes, I am interested. But I think the, the, the thing you're probably uh, referring to is um, the idea of intuition and... The, oh, the, oh um, and the, 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 the thing um, about um, uh, intuition and, and uh, system one thinking and system two thinking of the, or the first system and the second system thinking. Um, and to that I can now um, go to autopilot because this is a story I tell to students a lot and maybe it's good to tell here, to tell here as well. Um, I used to have a teacher that was dyslectic. And, um, but the nice thing about him was that he could speed read. So you would think that these two things are conflicting. Um, but then if you find out what dyslexia is, uh, um, it comes to the idea that um, one half of the brain or one way of looking at things is chronologically. So if you tell a story, you tell things, um, uh, this happened and then that happened and then so on, so on, so on. This is something that dyslectic people are not very good at, to, to, to be uh, um, logical. But uh, in that same art school or the design academy, we had a lot of dyslectic people who were very good at visual things. And the way I look at a visual thing is, uh, if you look at an image, you, you get all the information at once. Um, 
and try to describe a painting uh, when you're standing in front of it, like everything at once. It's, it's, it's a very fuzzy uh, way of um, uh, explaining and this. But, the fe but as soon as you see the painting, maybe that feeling comes in. Um, what my teacher uh, was able to do was look at a page in a book as a picture. So get all the information there at once. Now, mm, I, I make a very rough uh, extrapolation to um, ratio and intuition. To me, ratio is, or rational thinking, is um, reading. So if you explain a project to somebody or try to convince somebody that they have to do something, and you go like, well, we have this, that we do that, you can do this, or we, we should be doing this. Um, but I know that most of my reasons or most of my, uh, um, when I find that something has to be done or is good for somebody or it's something I should be doing, is very intuitive. And it's more like, I feel I should be doing this. And what I'm actually doing is thinking at a lot of things at the same time um, like, oh wait, this, but this is perfect because this is something that they would like because I've seen what type of dress she's wearing. Oh, but this is also very good because they actually are having a factory next door that has the same, um, uh, that can do this. Oh, but this would also mean it's very good because uh, this would make the product very cheap or cheaper than, uh, than the competition. Uh, but this is also very good because um, it's something that I love doing or that I would want to have for my own home. So I finally have this thing that I couldn't have produced anywhere. So there's a lot of reasons and all of those reasons together is, um, is intuition. But it is not the opposite of rational thinking. It's just rational thinking uh, very chaotically all together at once. And, and that's the same way like, okay, if reading and speed reading um, then if reading is rational thinking, then um, speed reading becomes, in the, if you do it in your mind, becomes intuition. And you can, you can um, train uh, intuition by doing a lot of um, uh, uh, rational reasoning, uh, but also listening to, to your feeling or try to find out why do I really want to do this? Um, and that's sort of what also where the neuroscience part comes in, or where the, where the brain part comes in. Thank you. Um, I guess with that in mind, I was wanting to wrap up one last question before I think we're gonna take a few from the audience. Um, you're working on all these different scales. Um, and you have all these different interests as well. So, you know, drawings and textiles and furniture. Um, have you ever thought about doing um, an architectural project? Um, uh, I thought about it. <laughs> no, well, actually, I'm not working all, all the different scales. Because um, I think I'm all the work I do can be fit in, in a box of, of maybe 25 by 25 by 25 centimeters, so 10 by 10 by 10 inches. Because um, I think if you would, from everything that I've made, if you would cut one part of 10 by 10 by 10 inches, um, you have the essence of it and you could even construct the whole product from it. So if, if you would bury it and they would dig it up in, in 200 years, you could probably um, um, uh, be able to reconstruct it or say what it was. Um, but um, that's, I mean, this is again a thing that I sometimes tell to students. Um, like you can, you, you should find your own scale, and but within that scale, um, I also prove that I can make products that are bigger than the 10 by 10 by 10 uh, box by just repeating it or treating it in a very uh, logical, natural way. 
Um, so if you would ask me to do uh, architecture, I think I would love to um, think of a brick that somebody could build a building with. And I think that would be my, my approach to how to do architecture. Um, and I think that's also something where textile comes in, or th and that's something I really love about textiles, that you start with such a small fiber and you make it into something bigger and into, into a surface or into a, um, a piece of textile or maybe even a chair. Um, that that I, I'm, I'm the person that works from small to something bigger. Great, thank you. Um, I think it's really clear just from the quick conversation that we've had um, that you put a lot of energy and passion um, and rigor into your practice um, and that's the reason why I really appreciate your work. Um, so thank you again for being here. Um, and do we wanna take some questions or how are we, Felix? <laughs> okay, great. Is the technology of the prop light related to the inspiration for the prop light? Yes and no. <laughs> um, the, but no, but I'll just tell you the anecdote of the prop light, uh, which is probably explaining better than the. Um, I made this uh, light for a cafe um, uh, five doors from my studio, and we made four, which was the downstairs, which is like the step ladder with the carnival lights on it. Um, and we thought, okay, let's make four, it's enough. It's, it's a funny idea, but I don't know how often you wanna see it. Uh, but we also sent that in for the Moy Frame Award, which for Moy was a way to look at new stuff coming in. Um, and um, when Marcel Wander saw it, he's like, we should maybe make this a product. And actually at that time I had already uh, given the rights to somebody else to make it, who was actually buying step letters, drilling holes in it, ca putting cables in it. And, and, I, th and, I, th and I, um, and, but I also know that if, if he would make it, it would be on a scale um, that I could still uh, enjoy it when I would run into a step ladder with lights because it's in a way it's it's a joke that runs all uh, maybe a bit uh, very fast but um, and I knew that if I would give the rights to Moy um, it would be sold too much it would be seen too much but then on the te on the telephone with discussion with Marcel one he said well maybe we can just do a stick or a, a, a thing with these carnival lights because they're so nice and then uh, when we came into production um, with the, the, my first prototype was actually uh, a square shape like this and everything, all these things were carnival lights. But um, it's very hard to make a dimmable LED with standard carnival lights. And then the product developer said, well, if we're gonna do that, um, we're probably gonna make a whole new system on the backside where you put LEDs and plastic. And, uh, um, and then I thought, uh, this is so ridiculous because the, the plastic carnival lights I use are already a representation of a light bulb. But then I use them with uh, LED lights. So, and then that should be again translated to something that looks like a carnival light. So it's like a retrofit of a retrofit of a retrofit. And then we said, okay, no, then the first, the reason the, why the, the carnival lights um, are what they are, um, it's, it's because it's like a plastic click system that, rip, that is um, uh, trying to be a glass light bulb. I thought, okay, then let's go back to the glass light bulb. How can we get LED to be more like a glass light bulb? And then we uh, made this. So that's how the technology made what it is. Um, uh, we've talked a lot about materiality and use of textiles, and I am really curious about, um, I guess, your relationship with color. And I wasn't sure if I wanted to ask this question until you mentioned Katarina Gross. And then I was like, well, that's why I love her work, is just like her use of color, and that is what is attractive about it. Um, so I, I guess I'm curious about 
your relationship with color and it seems to come across in a playful way in a lot of your work. And then I guess also how that translates in the industrial, like industrial design level when you are mass producing things because there, some companies maybe aren't, are afraid to go with like a strong color when, if you're doing something with them, so. Well, the, the, the danger of working with color is to so, sort of fall into trends um, or and enter because uh, and but the reason to f the way you fall into trends is that you always try to please people like like, like ton sur ton colors or uh, like all pastel or maybe um, and and um, or or the things that you've seen in a magazine and you know they look good together but w w a lot of my color experiments um, are attempts of me to be to put the most ugliest or hor or um, conflicting colors together, um, and then see which one actually still work, and which one don't. Uh, and then very often the ones that you immediately refer to something like, oh, but these are the colors of something you already know. Like maybe, oh, this is like the typical color that you go into if you go into a McDonald's, or this, these are the colors that you find when you when you're on the beach in Italy. Um, those are the less successful ones and the ones that the combinations where um, they have like multiple interpretations like oh but this could like one person would look at oh these are this is the beach in in in, in Greece and somebody else said no but this is the Arctic uh, um, those are the, the, the good ones but to, to make them you should try not to look at trends or try not to um, in, in a way be kind of blunt or very insensitive with color to get to colors that are uh, new and refreshing. Yeah. Another question? Mm. Oh, this is interior with the wallpaper that's black and white and abstract. Is that, what is that project? Is that your house? No. <laughs> the, the black and white wallpaper is, um, we did. Uh, I did it for uh, Appartamento, ma Appartamento magazine, which is uh, uh, the other uh, magazine. <laughs> I don't know if I can <laughs> talk about this. Um, um, and and yeah, it's a the free potato wallpaper. Um, and I'll I'll tell you the anecdote uh, for that. Um, and and what you're seeing is an exhibition in the, in the south of France in here that. Uh, Tiffany also saw and talked about. So there's quite a lot. If you see an exhibition, one out of three, the chances are that it's the south of France. Um, I once heard this rumor that um, if you send somebody enough black faxes, like a black sheet of paper in a fax machine, uh, you can start a fire at the place of the person that owns and that receives the black fax. Cause the paper turns black by um, um, uh, by heat, and if you ha want to make the whole paper black, so there was this rumor that if you send somebody enough black paper, you could start a fire at the other side of the world. But then um, that's not a very nice thing. Um, but when I when I got uh, my fax machine, I thought you could also send people presents. Um, and my fax machine uh, like had a roll of paper, um, and also the, the, when the paper that you put in, I once made a um, like a pattern on an A4 piece of paper, like letter size paper, um, and the idea was to to tape the back end to the, the the end that comes out immediately when you when you put it in. So you have like this roll of paper goes, so you can send somebody wallpaper. Uh, on the other side of the world, if he has a fax machine that still has the the roll, you know that was th this was uh, the uh, 1999 when I was thinking of that. Um, and then when um, I got to talk to Apartamento, um, I still had this idea of of making wallpaper in a in a or uh, giving 
because they had done a Max Lamb chair, but like the, the issue before where he had the, the, the plans on how to build a chair that he designed. And I thought it could be so much easier if you could just go to the copy shop and, and copy your design that you get for free with a magazine. And um, then during, like, what should the pattern be? Um, as, um, uh, one of my interns at the time came with this print of a potato, which was so silly that we liked it. And it could be uh, so many things. And if, if you look at the wallpaper, it's, it's like, it looks like a, uh, a polka dot. But they're actually all pictures of potatoes. And so the magazine actually had four pages that you can enlarge until, uh, I think, 141% on a copier, go to the copy shop, copy it on gray or uh, pink paper, and you can have the, the wallpaper in your house. But actually, I, I never, s and, and I think the article actually says, well, if you do it, send us a picture, but we never got a picture of it. <laughs> and even, even when we were doing it in, uh, in the south of France, we were cheating a bit because they, we printed very big stickers that they put on the wall because it's, it's a lot of work to, to do the A4. But if you would like to do it, you can go to the website and you can download the PDF and, and you can even print it out uh, from your uh, printer. Great. Thank you. Well, on the subject of uh, potatoes, I would like to thank you both for this conversation, a uh, fascinating conversation, and invite everyone to, encourage everyone to uh, indulge in the, uh, the buffet courtesy of dimes and um, the drinks courtesy of Saint-Germain, uh, everything courtesy of Moy. And uh, yes, thank you very much for coming. Thank you.